Hi everyone, uh, thank you for coming to see this presentation today, taking time out of your lunch time, I really appreciate it. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge and thank the Ngunnawal people, past, present and emerging as the traditional custodians of this land. So I'm Jackie. Uh, I'm an Objects Conservator and current Preventive Conservation Officer here at the Memorial and today I'll be taking you through the subject of my Master's Minor Thesis which I called Preserving Idols in Stained Glass, the Conservation of Napier Waller's Stained Glass Windows in the Hall of Memory. I undertook this research uh, at the Hall of the whole of memory. I did not. I undertook this research at the University of Melbourne uh, with lots of support from the memorial over about seven months last year in 2018. The stained glass windows decorating the three walls of the Hall of Memory were commissioned by the memorial board in 1937 and championed by the memorial's founders Colonel John Trelaw and Charles Bean. The windows were fabricated between 1947 and 1950 by First World War veteran and prominent artisan Mervyn Napier Waller. The glass is painted with 15 figures, idolising the Australian surface people who served in the First World War in heavily symbolic art deco inspired blues, greens, purples and reds. The Hall of Memory is also home to the Tomb of the Unknown Australian Soldier, as well as Four Pillars sculpture by Janet Lawrence and the mosaics also by Waller's later creation that cover the walls. Towering over the commemorative area, the windows serve a central role in the commemorative events and ceremonies which continue to draw thousands of visitors to the memorial annually. Despite being highly significant artworks, Little was known about the current condition and expected life cycle of the stained glass windows, with the last thorough examination being completed in 1989. The complexity of the material, combined with the lack of a national set of stained glass, glass conservation guidelines, have also made the preservation of stained glass an obscure field fraught with confusion and disagreement. I felt that these factors showed a need for some further investigation and planning for our windows here. The primary question that was posed to me at the start of this project was how can the memorial best conserve these stained glass windows? We want to preserve the significant values embodied by the windows to enhance understanding and appreciation of the stories that they tell into the future. As a heritage listed institution, as part of the parliamentary VISTA listing, among other listings, the memorial is also obliged to preserve the significant original fabric of the building to the best of our abilities. This knowledge helped to guide my research aims, which were to collate and analyse existing knowledge about the windows so that we can understand the past and know what we need to conserve in the future, and to identify how we can serve the windows in a way that not only minimises risks, but enhances their role as commemorative artworks in the Hall of Memory. So what does this look like? This involved looking into all potential factors that could affect the longevity of the windows, including accurate interpretation of their story and significance, the physical stability, as well as cultural or procedural concerns that might affect their care. All of these areas contributed to forming thorough documentation and recommendations for the memorial to consider for future conservation management. To conserve the windows, we first need to establish what it is about the windows that we should conserve, that is, what are their significant values. The window story is complex with influences from 20th century war, commemoration, artistic traditions and the personal experiences of the artist Napier Waller. I'll talk briefly about these to give you a background of the social, technological, historical and artistic context in which the windows were created. Napier Waller was devoted to the arts from a young age. He developed fine drawing skills at the National Gallery Schools in Melbourne under Louis McCubbin and Bernard Hall. In 1915, Waller enlisted in the Australian Imperial Force to serve in the First World War, and like many other servicemen, he made a last-minute marriage to his peer art student Christian Yandel before shipping off. In 1917, Waller was serving as an artilleryman in Bouillacourt, France, when his right and dominant arm was taken off by an explosive projectile. 
During his convalescence, though, and with his recent war experience fresh in his mind and need for personal artistic expression, Waller taught himself to draw with his left hand. Upon his discharge in 1918, he became an official war artist with a specialty in watercolour and mural paintings around Victoria. The devastation of the First World War was felt globally and in Australia, as with other countries, evoked the need for commemoration and community remembrance. State memorials were constructed in each capital city. The Australian War Memorial Act founded the National Memorial here in Canberra in 1925. The design was confirmed through competition in 1927 and construction began in 1928, but it was rapidly halted due to the Great Depression. Records show that Colonel Trelaw, the then director, saw potential in Waller as an academy-trained artist and First World War veteran, and he first invited Waller to submit sketches to the memorial in 1926, although the records aren't clear about what the sketches actually were. He was on a tour of the UK and Europe in 1929 where both Napier and Christian Waller learnt the Victorian arts and crafts techniques of making stained glass. They developed a mutual preference for pre-Raphaelite and Art Deco style and iconography under Victoria Wall in the Tower of Glass studio in Dublin, Ireland. The Victorian arts and crafts technique was developed in the late 19th century Britain amidst a wide movement to unify art and artisanal crafts. This also welcomed a new respect for artisanal craftspeople. The exact origins of stained glass are, aren't very clear. However, the technique traditionally developed through religious expression, and it wasn't until the Victorian arts and crafts movement that more secular themes were explored. The Wallers, among others, brought these techniques to Australia following the First World War. While the mass-produced stained glass factories were booming in the early 20th century, as the Wallers returned to Australia in the 30s and 40s, there was a rising need for bespoke memorial windows following the First and Second World Wars. In 1937, the Memorial Board agreed on the decorations of a sculpture, the mosaic and the stained glass windows for creating a shrine atmosphere in the Hall of Memory. Napier Waller was once again approached to submit designs. Correspondence in the memorial's archives show a close working relationship between Waller and the memorial board during this time, particularly Colonel Trelaw and Charles Bean in developing the designs for the stained glass. The three discuss the themes and different qualities that should be expressed in the windows, including their uniforms and facial expressions. This sketch by Waller with, with annotations which are likely either from Trelaw or Bean shows that the designs were still being confirmed as late as 1947. They agreed that iconography would bring the desired effect of elevating the status of normal Australians to religious icons. Trelaw expressed this goal in 1933 to one of the memorial's curators, writing that he was intent to idealise men who served and thus to some extent counteract the debased outlook in many recent war books. The depicted service people were then never intended to be representative of all those who served in the First World War, just a reflection of the idealistic and discriminating qualities of that time. The combined expertise of Wallop, Bean and Trelaw ensured accuracy and depth of meaning through the symbolism. While Waller instilled his own technical skill by achieving a combination of rectilinear imagery and architectural strength. While he wanted each figure to be unique and identifiable, he created a sense of unified marching columns of figures. Waller stated in a 1939 letter to Trelaw that the aim was to produce through repetition and a broad monotone of blue and blue grey, a certain dignified serenity of effect with a dim cathedral light. We are all familiar with the 15 qualities that make up the final works. They include comradeship, ancestry, patriotism, chivalry, loyalty, resource, candor, devotion, curiosity, independence, coolness, control, audacity, endurance, and decision. Beyond the familiar divisions of each bay, which are social, 
fighting and personal qualities, imagery analysis done by Susan Kellett in 2015 indicates there might be some further meanings. As a result of comparing photographs of the time with the painted expressions of each figure, Kellett asserts that Waller, like many artists, was inspired to use his contemporaries as muses. Waller had a documented interest in medieval theology and may have been inspired to follow the medieval tradition of depicting an institution's founders in the stained glass windows. Kellett suggests that the face of Charles Bean can be seen in, tr in control, Sir Henry Gullett in coolness, Colonel John Trelaw in endurance, Leslie Bowles, who was the original sculptural artist of the Hall of Memory, in candor, and Waller himself in the figure of chivalry. While Napier and Christian worked together from their home studio for many earlier commissions, they were actually separated by the time Napier began work in the Hall of Memory. Kellett also demonstrates a link between the face of devotion and the features of Waller's devoted artistic assistant and paramour, Lorna Rayburn. We do know that while Lorna Rayburn never served as a nurse, she displayed devotion to Napier. And they were married four years after Christian's death in 1954. In 1940, Waller signed an agreement with the Commonwealth of Australia to carry out the work to the highest standard for a cost of time and materials of £3,495, which the Bank of England website now tells me is about 350000 Australian dollars today. The facade of the Hall of Memory was completed and the Australian War Memorial was officially opened in 1941 amidst the Second World War. With the designs for the windows mostly agreed upon, fabrication and planning for their installation began in the mid-40s. The glass was purchased by the memorial from London and sent to Waller's studio in Ivanhoe, Victoria. The range of blues, greens, greys, purple and red of the windows primarily derives from the glass itself rather than the painted enamel. A receipt from the supplier Miller, Beale and Hyder is pictured up here on the left. There is a large amount of variance in colour and thickness to each pane of glass due to the traditional method of mouth blowing used to mimic medieval cathedral glass as seen in the right hand photo up here. Waller worked with a man named Mr Anderson who was the reported best glazier in Victoria at the time. Waller created life-size sketches called cartoons of each, of each vertical light, also known as a lancet. We also have these in the collection, including the one for resource, which you can see in the photo here. Following the cartoons, Mr. Anderson cut the glass, which Waller then painted with enamels, which would have been a similar composition to ceramic glaze. This would have, would have included powdered glass, gum arabic, pigment or metal oxide, which colours the glass during firing, and a flux to lower the melting temperature so that the whole thing could then be refired without melting the substrate. Waller mostly used brown and black enamels for shading and definition. He mostly used linear brush, brush strokes and stippling, which he referred to as his exclusive banister brush finish. The enamels were applied in several layers in a two-stage firing process to impart depth and strength. As can be seen in this technical sketch, Waller also used lamination and additional enamel on some of the exterior panes to moderate light in specific areas. Waller also signed his name on the ID tag of endurance as well as his signature and date, which can be seen on the first panel of the same figure in these photos here. After firing, Mr. Anderson assembled the glass into H-shaped lead strips called cames, then soldered the joints and it used a glazing putty for weatherproofing. The photo of independence here and diagram pictured give you an idea of how the glass and lead fit together. The putty is a combination of chalk and or plaster of Paris with lamp black for colouring, red lead to harden and all bound together with linseed oil. The panes were glazed in small panels about 50 by 40 centimetres each. Waller helped out near the end because as he stated frustratingly in a letter to the memorial, he felt that Mr Anderson was moving much too slowly. The installation of the windows was done in a matter of days. 
brass angle irons were set into interior masonry and coated with a mixture of copal varnish and linseed oil for good adhesion with the mastic cement. The, the glazed panels were then inset from the bottom up in situ, using additional panel joining leads and mastic to set them in place, as specified in this letter from Waller from 1950. Mild steel saddle bars were then secured to the brass angle irons, specifically every 26 centimetres on the interior to reinforce the structure, and then tied to the panel joining leads using copper wire. The final product is 15 lights, consisting of 183 panels, each with between 20 and 60 individual glass panes. That means that there are about 9,000 individual glass panes making up these windows, each individually cut by hand, fired, shaped and hand painted. The entire windows are about five by seven and a half metres in size and being raised about three metres from the ground are almost 11 metres tall. The tracery, mullions and arches around the windows consist of clay structural brickwork with Wonderbine sandstone cladding on the exterior and as we know, a mosaic of Waller's later creation covering the inside of the walls, as you can see in this photo. So how much of what we see today is original? The answer is gladly most of it. There have been some minor repairs and loss of original material, including some minor paint loss due to glass breaks or bubbles in the enamel form during firing, as well as at least four panes, which is out of 9,000, not so bad, of glass that have been replaced due to damage. Several areas of paint loss have also been repainted. However, these are additions and though while some of them are disfiguring, they don't constitute significant damage. All in all, this is insignificant loss over almost 70 years. The significance of the windows is well established and the historical and artistic contexts of their creation demonstrate many aspects of this. The windows serve an essential role in the present day ceremonial and commemorative function of the memorial, contributing to their social significance. Understanding the window's significance, I could then establish the priorities for conservation. This means balancing historical integrity and authenticity with the functional commemorative nature, all of which are essential to the window's significance. Best practice in stained glass conservation prioritises minimal intervention and preventing damage to both balancing the architectural and visual functions of the windows. Most agree that due to the structural requirements of stained glass, the lead putties, steel bars and copper tyres are sacrificial elements that must be replaced when they fail or threaten the glass or the enamel. Three main things indicate the original appearance and purpose of the windows, which will help guide us in preserving the artistic values. Because the windows are intentional monuments, their purpose, as, divine, as defined by prominent art historian Alwa Regal, is to keep a moment from becoming history, to keep it perpetually alive and present in the consciousness of future generations. This means that even though the window's significance may develop new meanings, they are essentially tied to the original significance they were created for. This is contrary to many of the other objects that we have in the collections here that may have developed or acquired significance over their lifetime by use in war or perhaps association with a person or event. While the original state can be difficult to identify because it could be drawn from so many different times, from their conception to the final product in 1950, we can draw so strong conclusions from several places, including extensive correspondence and detailed drawings such as the cartoons that I mentioned previously. Due to the durability of the glass and enamel, we can also be confident that their colour and properties has not changed in essence since their creation. To know what conservation is necessary, I then needed to look into whether there is a discrepancy between significance and condition. To do this and plan for future changes, I began to investigate the material nature of the windows to analyse their life cycle. This means fully understanding the material components, how they have and could possibly physically and chemically interact with each other and their environment. The aim was not only to understand and predict deterioration, but also thoroughly document the windows so that their condition may be tracked well in future. 
To understand this process, I gathered information from a variety of sources, starting with literature and speaking with Australian stained glass conservators, who have actually worked on some of the others, other windows created by the Wallers previously. I also reviewed the last condition report undertaken in 18, 1989 by Sue Bassett, which was really thorough and enormously helpful for me when I was trying to track the rates of deterioration. With the help of some colleagues here, I then examined the windows from both the interior and exterior using reflected light, transmitted light and raking light to fully inspect and document the condition of each element. You can see what I mean by some of the types of light in the right-hand photo pictured here. I documented the window's condition, including all of this information, in addition to further photography of each of these perspectives. To understand the materials even further and their deterioration processes, and again with support from the Memorials Conservation Team, we took samples of several materials and analysed inorganic materials using X-ray fluorescence, also known as XRF, and organic materials with Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy, also known as FTIR. Each element has particular responses and vulnerabilities to the 10 agents of deterioration. But in this section, I'll focus on the most likely envir environmental agents, which include water, inappropriate temperature and relative humidity, contaminants, light, physical damage, and pests. I'll run through the particular chemistry and life cycle for each major element and then the current condition briefly, but if you'd like any more detail about the process or condition, please just ask me at the end. Stained glass windows are structurally dependent on the LEDs, copper tie wires and glazing putty for stability. They work together to hold the glazed panels into alignment and into the wall openings. The future of these components could the failure of these components could lead to slumping or bulging of the windows, resulting in glass breakage and loose panes. Cracking and movement of the Hall of Memory structure has also been an issue in the past. It is thought to be caused by faults in the original construction as well as expansion of the clay bricks and has been closely monitored since it began soon after the memorial's initial construction. Engineering reports and materials assessments completed by Blyvola Architects and more recently GHT Engineering confirm minor seasonal and daily movements. These have plateaued and while monitoring continues show no current signs of danger to the window. The lead cames are vulnerable to damage caused by thermal expansion and contraction as well as physical forces such as wind, vibration, building movement and impacts that fatigue the lead, causing cracking and weakening. Corrosion may also occur as a result of exposure to water and pollutants, such as deterioration of adjacent glass, as well as galvanic corrosion caused by contact with other metals that were used in the windows. The severity of this depends on the lead's metallurgy, the shape and thickness of the cames, as well as the layout of the lead matrix design itself. Poorly made cames are known to last only 70 years before they begin to fail. The solder is generally more stable, though it may crack and weaken with age, just like the LEDs. So we analyzed the metallurgy of the LEDs in our windows with XRF. XRF identifies materials by emitting high energy light that causes distinctive X-ray emissions to be produced by each element that is then reflected and received by the instrument. We found that the LEDs contain trace elements of copper, tin, antimony, and silver. The trace elements identified greatly enhance the durability of the LEDs, and the composition is actually akin to current standards for conservation grade lead, which is really good news for us, meaning it means that they could be expected to last up to 200 years before they require replacement. The glazing putty between the glass and the lead plays a really big role in stabilising the whole matrix and is often overlooked in its significance. The linseed oil and used in the glazing putty is damaged by light and water exposure, which causes cracking, powdering and loss, particularly on the exterior face. This leaves voids for ingress of water, pollutants and biological growth that can cause corrosion of the leads 
water damage to the glass and further putty loss. The exterior, part, the exterior putty is normally seen as a sacrificial element that needs to be replaced before it begins to fail. And this could be anywhere between five to 15 years, depending on the environment. Interior putty is generally protected from these conditions and doesn't usually need replacing um, for a much longer time scale. Physical and thermal forces are the most common cause for damage in modern glass. It is vulnerable to damage and breakage from movement in the lead structure, vibration, impacts, and extreme temperatures caused by sunlight, frost, and fire. While the modern glass used in the windows is extremely stable, it still remains vulnerable to water and pollutants in the right combination. Glass is composed of fused silica, lime, and an alkali, generally sodium or potassium. Over time, the alkali can be dissolved by water exposure and the silica lime network broken down, resulting in the formation of rainbowing, crusts, and eventual, eventual delamination. Pests such as mud wasps, pigeons, and fungi can also cause damage to all elements of the windows due to their corrosive and water-attracting chemistry of their nests and waste. Not all of the glass in the windows is exposed to the elements as it's coated in enamel in most areas. We analyzed the composition of the exposed glass, which indicated the presence of silica and metal oxides that produce color as well as stabilize the network. SEM EDX analysis completed by Bassett also indicated that the potassium levels were much higher than sodium, which means that the glass will be more vulnerable to water damage. With the right combination of water and pollutants, this process may still take 50 to 100 years to begin and start to cause significant damage. The vitreous glass paint has a very similar composition to the glass panes and has a similar deterioration process in response to water, physical damage, pollutants, as well as extreme temperatures. However, the composition of the paint, such as containing too much binder, which is the gum arabic I mentioned earlier, along with the homogeneity of the solution, the way it's applied, and firing environment can make enamel more vulnerable to deterioration. These can result in flaking and delamination, as well as powdering of the enamel, and are particularly of, a con of concern on the exterior painted panes that are exposed to the elements. Following the professional techniques they learned in the UK, the Wallers are gladly known to have used very stable materials in general, but also including the enamels. The chemistry of the paint on these windows was also analysed with XRF. And we found uh, the presence of lead, iron, cobalt and copper metal oxides, which would have been added as colouring similar to, similar to the glass, but also they will prevent the dissolution of soluble salts, which is the alkali. They were also, we were also um, sadly finding several areas that where the paint did not actually contain any silica, which indicates that it will have a very poor bond to the substrate and be more vulnerable to flaking and delamination in the future. While we want the windows obviously to last as long as possible, the minimum time required for the life cycle of materials is at least 200 years, starting from 1981. And this is to match the specified time laid out in the cultural management plan for Parliament House. With some maintenance and conservation treatments, I'm confident that our windows will comfortably achieve that 200 year mark. They are almost 40 years in from 1981 and deterioration processes appear to be progressing at a normal rate. However, this doesn't mean that we can be complacent because we did identify active deterioration processes that must be monitored so that we can be sure that they don't become worse and cause significant damage in the future. We also need to be really careful of any unusual environments of dust and vibration that may be caused by the future redevelopment. Um, and we need to ensure that there aren't any unmitigated effects from these issues. So what next? We have started to plan to carry out monitoring and conservation treatments over the coming years. At the end of this year, we'll be cleaning the interior surface of the windows, and we'll also be scheduling in some exterior cleaning, putty repair, glass break repair, 
and sold a repair with an aim to have this completed in the next few years. In preparation for redevelopment, we'll also be working closely with our building services team and the program team to plan and undertake vibration monitoring for the entire original fabric of the building, including the Hall of Memory mosaic and stained glass. The condition of the windows will also then be monitored every two years to record and respond to changes in the identified deterioration processes. So here we are, after a broad investigation into the risks faced by Waller's stained glass windows in the Hall of Memory. I don't have all the answers, obviously, and expect that we'll have many more discussions about the conservation strategy. But I've attempted to cover a wide range of potential factors to inform future decision making regarding the windows. The windows are an essential element of the Hall of Memory. Because the harsh environmental conditions of this context are unavoidable, I've referenced best practice and the original purpose of the windows to outline priorities that focus conservation on the defining elements. These include the depicted imagery in Waller's unique style that is indicative of the social, cultural and historical context, as well as the colours and dynamic quality of light that are unique to the material and contribute atmosphere to the Hall of Memory. The conservation priorities I've discussed here, I think, are clear. But while there's good reason to pay particular attention to the stained glass windows, the other elements of the Hall of Memory and the commemorative area, as well as the original fabric of the entire building, are mutually essential to preserve the social and historical significance of this place. This means that we need to continue to find holistic strategies to preserve all of these aspects, as best we can with the resources that we have available. And thank you again for coming to listen to the presentation. Um, I'd also like to thank my thesis supervisors at the University of Melbourne, Gina Liebenspiel and Nicole Say, as well as my supervisor here at the Memorial, George Bailey, uh, and the Memorial team for their ongoing support. Um, Feel free now. I'd like to welcome more questions, but if you want to catch me later, I'll hang around for a bit if you'd like to talk face to face. Uh, and if anyone is interested, I can also provide a PDF copy of my full thesis if you're interested. That's it. Any questions? I was just wondering if the, um, the windows were cleaned in the past. They have been cleaned. Um, records were a bit sporadic, but uh, as far as I could tell, the exterior has never been cleaned, but the interior has been cleaned a couple times in recent years, um, just with warm water and uh, where it needed some mild detergent. But it's, um, it's more common in best practice just to clean the exterior. Uh, but because the windows in the Hall of Memory are semi-open to the external environment and we do have an issue with pigeons and other pests flying around in there, that means that we do need to clean the interior more frequently than is standard. Anyone else? No? With the um, renovations of, of the memorial, there'll, there'll be a lot of vibration and so forth. Would this affect anything in the um, hall of memory? Yeah, um, that's a good question. We're not quite sure. Uh, that's something that we'll be looking further into. Um, We've made a plan with building services to purchase some uh, monitoring equipment, vibration monitoring equipment, so that we can create a baseline level of vibration before construction starts, and then hopefully work with um, the managers of the process, construction and demolition process as well of Anzac Hall to minimise the effects. It's just something that we're going to have to keep an eye on, really, and. Um, try and use construction and demolition methods that minimise any vibration. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, thank you everyone. <laughs>